Okay guys, in the previous videos, previous two videos, I talked about the linear gamma and Prophoto primaries and all that stuff and I said I'm going to explain in a different video what it means. Well, unless you're very curious about what it means and you have a lot of patience, this might be something that's a bit boring to you or maybe just excess knowledge. So, you can clearly skip ahead if you want to. There's not something here that's going to make you a better in color management per se, right? But if you're just curious about what's going on behind the scenes and what is this all about, stick around. Otherwise, skip ahead. Okay, so let's start with something that we're already familiar with. Now, this is a diagram which basically has two axes. One is for the actual input, actual luminance, and we have for the output, which is perceived luminance in percentages. That is quite simple, actually, and this is something that we saw when we talked about uh, gamma, gamma or tone response curve in terms of calibrating your monitor, if you remember. Well, this is a part where we talk about images instead of gamma inside of our you know, monitor, and if you remember back then I also mentioned images and I showed you something, but I didn't explain it quite well. Well, this is, this is the time when I wanted to explain it more properly because you had to understand how color management works inside of Photoshop, how all the color different color profiles work and all that stuff. So now that you have that knowledge we can continue. Well, <clears throat> your camera captures light in a linear fashion. Pretty much like a straight line in this, right? And this is what is known as linear capture. So for example, 50% uh, gray, let's, let's imagine that, that we have a gradient, right? And the uh, distribution of tones would be quite linear. So, <clears throat> you know, 50% for the input is 50% for the output, right? Because it's a linear way to capture light. Well, unlike the camera, our eye is different. Our eyes is not linear. It's something more closely resembling this. And it basically can adapt to, you know, shadows and details in the shadows and also details in the more brighter area and it can adapt to this with wider dynamic range than most cameras and also we see a little bit better detail in the shadows I guess it's an evolutionary thing you know in in the bright light you don't see all that many useful details that you need but in the dark shadowy environment it could be a tiger hiding in the bush or it could be a prey item and also we don't adapt going from dark to light and vice versa right away. Maybe you heard about so-called day, daylight uh, and nighttime vision and the idea is that we need some time to adjust quite a, quite a bit of time actually and there's a really interesting background story I want to tell about this uh, you, I first saw this on the popular uh, Discovery Channel show called Mil Midbusters where these guys try to collect different myths and, and try to confirm are they something that they can bust and say that's not true is it plausible or is it confirmed quite funny stuff so basically the uh, the myth was why do pirates wear eye patches and somebody said it's better because it allows them to adjust to the dark or vice versa going from dark to light quicker than if they don't wear an eye patch and the story goes that if you were on the deck or on the you know, outside on the deck of the vessel, there was you know, during the day there were a lot of bright sunlight re reflecting from the water and so on and so forth. So the idea was, if you had to go below in the, below deck and there was you no, know, besides candlelight, I guess there was not much else down there. There was there was no electricity or anything like that. So you would have a hard time adjusting right away to those dark conditions and this specifically would matter in terms of battle right going from one place to the other let's say you're you're attacking the other ship you're boarding that vessel and now you need to go down below and fight people below deck well if you wear an eye patch your eyes will adjust one would adjust to light and the one with the patch would adjust to dark so when you go down below you just switch the eye patch and all of a sudden you would be adapted right away instantly almost to that darker environment you would see with one eye not good for binocular vision but you'll still get a 
edge against your potential opponent that you're sword fighting or whatever, right? And in this Midbuster series, they tried to put an obstacle course where they would put an eye patch and try to go through the obstacle course. One would go with the eye patch and the other would without the eye patch in a dark environment. And they proved the myth to be confirmed. It's quite a big advantage to have an eye patch. So that's that's basically the difference in the way we adjust to dark and light tones. We don't adjust immediately, but we do have a more dynamic, bigger dynamic range than a um, camera. So camera, let's get back to our story about camera versus eye. Well, camera captures linear, in linear fashion, right? The, the one, um, like the, see, the one you see here on this diagram, this um, purple line, and the cyan line would represent how, approximately how our eyes would perceive the the luminance. Well, the problem with that is that if you remember, for if we talk about the linear capture, it's pretty straightforward, right? 50% for input, 50% for output. Well, if you wanted to get 50% brightness just for your eyes, it would have to be here, which in terms of input luminance would be maybe, you know, what, 20, 18% or something like that. 21, 22%, something like that, right? And if you wanted to get 50% from the input, it would match the output. It would be somewhere here, it would be a lot brighter image. So basically, that's the problem we have. One does not match the other, right? So the idea was, okay, we see something with our eyes in the field, we capture it with our camera, and then next time we saw it in print or when we see it in in screen we want one to match the other that's the whole point right what it, what does it good to us if we capture with camera in one way and then we see it in another on our screen a lot brighter or darker image right so we need to find a way to match one with the other and how to do that is something I'll explain in a minute but that's basically the difference between the way camera captures digitally and the way our eyes see you know, in an analog fashion. And by the way, I think the, the analog cameras with the film were more closely resembling the way our eyes see. This is a problem with digital capture. And uh, in, the, in the upcoming slides, I'll explain more how we do it uh, to, to correct for that and also why some of the reasons behind we do it the way we do. Okay? Okay, so let's get back to our story about the linear versus nonlinear, the linear capture versus our nonlinear eyes. Well, same diagram, remember? Well, if you remember, this is the representation of the linear capture, the way camera captures. Well, for various very complex and, you know, reasons and so on, what we do with our images once we develop our RAW file. Now, if you're working in a, you know, camera RAW or something like that, and you're developing your RAW file, when you're saving it out, uncertain format, you are doing what it's known as image encoding. You're encoding your your um, gamma uh, curve inside of an image. If your camera shoots and immediately captures it in, you know, trans, trans, uh, transfers it, transforms it or converts it into a JPEG or a TIFF or something like that and uses maybe a, you know, an sRGB or a DO, um, Adobe RGB, it also does the same thing. Depending on what the the output you're tell it to, it will use the gamma, usually of gamma which encoded, which we're known as gamma 1 divided by 2.2. And it looks like something like this curve right here. Now it's a similar curve that we saw when we, uh, in the last slide, when we talked about the way human eyes see, right? So you might ask, well, what, what are we doing here? were just brightened up the image to the point where it was already too bright for our eyes, right? Well, in order to correct for this and get the end result to match how we perceive the end result to match the linear capture of the of the camera, so we need to do something in reverse from this. Okay? So we need to shift this curve like a mirror image to the other side. 
and we so this is image encoding right and this is only for recording the data within the image well we need to add to this another curve which we call image decoded with a gamma of usually 2.2 or whatever is in the profile of the image so for example sRGB would have approximate gamma of 2.2 Adobe RGB would have gamma of 2.2 some other uh, different um, color profiles will have that but uh, Profoto and color match would have 1.8 gamma and so on so the, the image encoder would be in a different fashion and that's for displaying our data let me show you what I mean so the image decoded version would, would be curved in the opposite direction now why is this <laughs> the, the shape the way it is and, and what does this matter how does this work well, let me try to explain if this is the linear gamma, the one that's just a straight line, right? That's the way camera captures. Now what we want to do is we want to manipulate this curve in such a way that the end result matches the way our eyes see, but it also, so, so we basically set it up in such a way that it's, it compensates for the, our nonlinear vision and still looks linear like this. So here's what it what we need to do. We need to bend this curve first in one way. That's called image encoding. Gamma encoding that is. Okay, so we bend it in that way, right? And then we need to bend it back. And this is done with decoding. And this decoding is done by essentially two ways. If you have a profile within the image, let's say you have an sRGB profile within the image and you view the image inside of a color managed application such as Photoshop it will read the profile of the image it will read sRGB and it will be gamma approximately of 2.2 and it will know that it needs to bend this uh, red curve in the other way by gamma 2.2 that's one way we can bend this curve another way would be that we view the image in non-color managed application and then what would bend this well that would be done by the monitor if you remember we also calibrate our monitor to gamma 2.2 so let's say let's talk about the image version first so the other curve will start to move in this way and it will start to shift the red curve down right more and more until eventually the the white curve which represents the decoding of the of the image that's written within the profile such as sRGB and that's done by Photoshop eventually it will bend back the red curve to be linear so that's actually then how we essentially see the image just like the camera did right this is the way we trick basically compensate for difference between linear uh, gamma uh, gamma capture by the camera and nonlinear vision by the human eye and this gives us the perceived linear gamma at the end uh, of course just like I explained this is something that can be done by either your monitor or a color managed application if it has a profile within the image the one that can read and by the way Photoshop can actually do both of those things it can do gamma encoding and decoding so if you take these two curves here's an interesting thing you remember when we talked about um, assigning a profile versus converting to profile well when you converting to profile you're doing essentially encoding in a way so you manipulate the red curve when you're doing a signing profile you're manipulating the uh, you're not changing the data within the image you're just changing the appearance the way it's going to be displayed so you're manipulating with the white curve why is this all matter right well let me go back before I continue there's uh, something I want to explain all of this that you just explained in fact despite what I just said the idea that we compensate for the human vision that's just a bonus the real reason why we do this is twofold one is because this is more of a legacy feature something that was left 
from the old days. You know, back in the um, I don't know 50s, 60s, or whatever, they were they were using uh, analog TV sets, and analog TV sets they couldn't display the image and and the data properly linearly. So they because of some limitations of the device. So basically, what they did is they would create they would put when they put together these TVs they would have this white curve and it was about 2.5 and then the um, it was gamma about 2.5 I think and then uh, they realized and then they would send the signal from the TV station that was encoded in the image and everything the signal was encoded with this red curve and you know one would counteract the other and the idea was that you get proper looking image. The way camera captured it, you see that image eventually on your TV set. But they realized that, you know what, we need a little bit brighter image because at the time when they were watching the TVs, you know, the, the typical American family or whatever was watching these TVs and the, they judged the environment in which they were watching and so on, and they figured uh, the image is a bit too dark, so let's reduce the gamma. And then went from gamma 2.5 to gamma 2.2. And then after that, they realized, well, you know, when we got to um, our CRT, those were the big analog monitors that you had on your desk, you know, the thing that takes up most of your room. Well, at, back in those days, well, we would encode our images, which were digital, to be displayed on the analog monitor that was using the same technology as on those monitors, I mean, those TVs back in the day right and it was also gamma 2.2 um, the standard for those CRT monitors well after a while we switched to digital monitors the L LCDs well the digital LCD monitors they didn't have to have um, they, they didn't have you know the limitations that CRT had they could have a linear gamma but oral images were already encoded using gamma 1 divided by 2.2 the red curve right so instead of introducing a new standard to be more compatible with the images that were viewed on the old CRTs what they have done is that they've taken whatever weird looking curve the native tone response curve that LCD monitors had and they didn't look like this they were more like S shape they would match that with approximate native gamma of 2.2 and they would do that within the monitor using a, I think what they call a lookup display like a like a basically some kind of a firmware within monitor that would bend the um, the uh, gamma to be just like the one that we here see uh, the the white curve right well we talked about the native gamma and how that's a great idea but unfortunately with all the different monitors it, it just wasn't the best scenario right we would have one that's natively 2.2 that's other is not 1.9 one is 2.1 so we need to calibrate it to some standard the, the one that matches the way the images were encoded the one that matches the reverse of the um, the red curve right well so that this long history basically set the standard to 2.2 right so that was one reason why we why we still uh, need to um, decode our images to 2.2 not necessarily because of the human vision but to not introduce a new standard just to keep it uh, with the, you know compatible to all the all the other standards and the second most important reason is that I think you can compensate for the human vision with a linear curve not even bending it at all in images uh, but the re the problem with that is that you would need more bits of data to on a gradient to do that if you were to display a, a smooth gradient and somebody suggested numbers like I think it was for the bend curve you can compensate for human vision with I don't know eight bits of data and to have a linear curve and to compensate for human vision you would need to put more data uh, throughout the curve so throughout the linear curve so you would need 8 bits of data you would need 11 bits of data and you know we, we want smaller images smaller bits of data and so on and so forth so in, they had already a standard of 
with this bent curve they could uh, compensate for human vision additionally uh, with less bits of data so for all those reasons they decide well you know what we'll just stick with uh, with profiles that can be then you know gamma decoded either by a monitor or by uh, some kind of a color managed application like Photoshop so that's primary the reason now this this story about the human vision and how we compensate for that well since we are already bending it that's you know approximately a way to kind of compensate for human vision but the human vision cannot be really represented with a curve like this it's it, it's just an approximation so it's not really for the human vision it's just a bonus that kind of closely matches and uh, why is all this matters this whole linear story well here's the thing I remember when I talked about how color management works within our different applications such as Photoshop and then I specifically talked about um, camera raw and Lightroom and how do they differ and I talk about the linear gamma and all that well here I explain why first I explain what the linear whole story is now let me show you what happens so the internal process in color space within camera raw and Lightroom is the same it uses Profoto RGB primaries which is basically the gamma of RGB and then it uses the the, the tone response curve of linear gamma 1.0 why is that well because we just saw how our cameras capture linearly right so you what you what you want to do when you're developing a raw file you don't want to bend that curve until the last possible moment so that you have truly the purest uh, most untainted uh, raw data that you can in order to manipulate with it and also uh, you want to use the biggest color warehouse color space to put all this color from your camera right and that's done with Profoto primaries we talked about how big it is and then on top of that we're using a 16-bit um, for our raw conversion if you remember that from the bit depth section so using those three things we really have the capacity in our raw converter whether that's Lightroom or Camera Raw to take the full advantage of the raw file and uh, but the problem with this is that if you do this to, to get the most out of raw as a processing um, process you still need to somehow encode and, and decode the image and do all that stuff so that you don't get to see uh, too dark image because if you left it like this you would get too dark image right so what they've done is the image that you see on screen the histogram and all that well that's decided as we saw in that video by the setting you set here right so that will be prepared just like you would when you open it inside of Photoshop already just for your uh, you know convenience essentially is depending on your setting whether it's sRGB color match Adobe RGB or Pro Photo that's what the camera raw is doing on the fly converting it for your convenience although in the process you know the processing in the background is done using this internal processing color space I don't think it even has a name it's just something they use in the background Lightroom on the other hand just complicates things now this gets a little bit more complicated so I, I hope this video will explain it a bit better so the internal processing engine well processing of camera raw and Lightroom the, if they're the same version works ex exactly the same but this is where they differ unlike when we saw back then here the um, the, the uh, image and the uh, histogram is represented with a nicknamed uh, color space called Melissa RGB and it has Profoto primaries and the tone response curve of sRGB which is approximately gamma 2.2 so what does this mean well let me show you so the Lightroom viewing space is nicknamed Melissa RGB and there's a, some background story why that is apparently uh, one of their people working in Adobe you now said that all of the spaces are named by male names and then they use somebody there who's working for them you know let's call her Melissa RGB but it's just a nickname so basically it has the Profoto primaries 
and it has a tone response curve of sRGB which is approximately 2.2 this is because we want to preview our images properly right while we're working with Lightroom but we also uh, want to keep the internal processing engine of well the internal processing engine both in Lightroom and Camera Raw has the Pro Photo primaries but it has a linear gamma to take the most out of to take the most advantage of, of uh, rock you know capture but uh, we want to present the image on screen you know in the interface to be what we expect it to be in real life right you know, so they've kind of decided to go with Melissa RGB because it was a different team that worked on Camera Raw versus Lightroom for some reason I'm not sure why they decided that okay we won't just take the advantage of the internal processing um, engine we will unlike in uh, Camera Raw where they you already set your output options and based on that you previewing your, previewing your image in Lightroom they're complicating things they're adding a third kinda no man's land type of color space called Melissa RGB and I'm not sure why but that's what they decided to do so when you're viewing histogram and all that and it doesn't match anything else and in case you're wondering what's going on in the background this is it and let me show you something else at the end this is a screenshot from uh, Photoshop where I did a little bit of experimenting so what I did is th I calibrated my monitor to gamma 2.2 and currently you're viewing how I view, saw it then right and then the image was sRGB which is approximate gamma of 2.2 and this is the way they look they pretty much look the way you would expect and then what I did is I stripped the profile from the image so it didn't have any profile and I calibrated my monitor to gamma 1.0 the linear gamma right and as you can imagine this brightened up my entire screen quite a bit but even though the image was encoded in 1 divided by 2.2 because there was no profile Photoshop does not know what it needs to do with an image it needs a profile to be able to compensate for that image for that gamma encoding in order to decode the image right well the monitor is then the primary source of how the image would be displayed but since my monitor was here calibrated to gamma 1.0 then everything was bright the user interface both and the image and then I put back the profile for the image to sRGB and this is what happened monitor affected everything the entire user interface everything the only thing that wasn't affected was the image it was actually compensated for the fact the way monitor is calibrated and what the profile of the image is and this was all done by Photoshop I believe all color managed applications or at least they should do the same thing so somebody suggested that it doesn't matter how you calibrate your monitor the color managed application will always compensate for that and here we see a proof of that problem is that if the image doesn't have a proper profile or doesn't have any profile at all or if you're viewing it in non-color managed application then you get a problem second issue is that as you can see if you, if you calibrate like this your interface would be so brighter that it will affect the perception you have of the image itself even though it's corrected the background would be too bright and would affect the way you perceive the contrast within the image itself so that's a problem and not to mention that the user interface now looks like crap as well so what I would do is I would try to match whatever you know working space or ICC profile of the image I'm working with with my monitor uh, profile so if I'm working with sRGB or Adobe RGB or something I would calibrate my monitor to 2.2 if I'm working with uh, Pro Photo or Color Match, which have profiles 1.8 uh, gamma, I still wouldn't calibrate to 1.8 because of two things. It's not that big of a difference, 
and most images that I view are on the online or some other places without color managed applications they won't be pro photo they will be sRGB so I want to match them and on top of that you know most most monitors will have more native gamma to 2.2 than 1.8 so that will be my reason anyway that's something I wanted to explain like the background story behind all of this gamma issue because when I started researching about color management you know, I ran into the, this gamma story and it was really confusing to me I had no idea what it does and everybody's keep mentioning it in all the books and everywhere so it took me a while to kind of figure out okay what is this gamma story all about so and since I didn't hold this research anyway I thought well you know, I might as well show it to you then as well but like I said this is more advanced stuff this is stuff that you know if you're curious you want to know if not just skip ahead and, and find you know watch other videos which will have more practical value for you when you're when you're really preparing images anyway that's my story about gamma